And let's turn to the book of Philemon tonight. It's at the end of the New Testament there. There's, um, if you back up from Revelation, you'll see Hebrews a little ways back. And then you'll have Philemon right in front of Hebrews. And we'll start at verse 20 tonight. Philemon chapter 1, verse 20. It says, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Lord, bless as we look at these verses. Uh, Lord, help us through them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I want to jump in tonight. Uh, we looked at verse 21 um, last week, and we're going to... Um, hit verse 22 and, and maybe maybe finish out the chapter tonight. Um, you know, Paul has written to Philemon about a runaway slave named Onesimus, and uh, Onesimus had gotten saved through Paul and had become a great help to Paul in prison. And um, when Onesimus got saved, uh, God began to deal with him about returning to his master. And so Paul was good friends with Philemon. It appears that Paul had had a huge part in Philemon's Christianity. And so Paul and Philemon are very good friends. And Paul writes to Philemon from prison and says, you know, Philemon is coming. In fact, uh, Onesimus is coming. In fact, Onesimus is the one that's going to put this letter in Philemon's hand. And um, so that's where we're at in verse 22, Philemon is reading this letter, and in verse 22, Paul says, But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. And, um, you know, if you see uh, if you see Paul in this letter as a picture of Jesus Christ, and uh, that's really easy to do, um, you know what you see? Again, and I know we have visited this thought, and uh, we we've we've mentioned it a lot in the last few weeks. Um, but you know what Paul just said in verse twenty-two? He said, "Philemon, I'm coming." You know, Paul has given him instructions about hand, how how to handle this situation, and um, in a sense, uh, Paul is not going to be there in person. You know, a lot of the things we do. Uh, it would really help us if the Lord was standing right there in person. Uh, it really would help us, I think, on a lot of fronts. But, you know, uh, our Lord is invisible. Um, whom having not seen, we love. And he's right there. And he's in us as believers. And um, But Paul writes to Philemon. He says, Philemon, uh, he says, I'm, I'm hoping to be out of jail shortly. And he says, you're one of the first stops. He said, I'm coming. Philemon, you and me are going to be looking each other in the eye. And boy, that's really significant in light of this letter. Paul says, you know, I, I may hear about how, how it all goes with, <clears throat> with you and Onesimus. But he said, uh, but he said, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna see it for myself. He says, you know, you can't trust everything you hear. But he said, but I'm gonna show up in person and I'm gonna see how it all played out. I am coming to your house. Prepare me a lodging. You know what the Lord Jesus did on various occasions? He showed up at people's houses. You know, uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, it says they were great friends of our Lord. 
And, uh, and whenever the Lord rolled into town, into Bethany, the Lord Jesus would stop in. You know, it was different back then. We have the advantage of the telephone. And, uh, you know, the, oh, if, if uh, that is an advantage most of the time. We have the advantage of the telephone. We have the advantage of the computer. We have all these ways to uh, let people know that you're coming. Uh, but, you know, back in the old days, uh, unless you had a friend that was arriving a week or two ahead of you, you know, there was no way for anybody to know if you were coming. You know, unless you wrote him a letter and gave him six months notice. Um, my uh, my stepdad was in World War II. And um, during that era, he said, uh, when the soldiers came back from being overseas, he said, the people loved the soldiers. The people really respected the whole cause that was involved with World War II. And um, he said, uh, you know, the soldiers would come back. And he said, we would come back on leave. And he said, we, we didn't have a car. We didn't have any way to get around. He said, so we would get on the side of the road with what little gear we had. We'd stick out our thumb. And he said, uh, you know, it was different in those days. You know, you weren't, you weren't worried. You weren't hearing about all these crazy crimes. You weren't worried about all the creeps and the predators and all that stuff. And he said, that, man, you stuck out your soldier and you were wearing that green uniform. He said, somebody was going to pick you up like, like now. He said, they, they love the soldiers. He said, one day we were, we were coming through Kentucky and we were um, on the side of the highway and uh, somebody had dropped us off and we were walking, hoping to catch another ride. And he said, uh, we looked over the hillside and he said, down over the hillside was this lone log house and smoke coming out of the chimney. And he said, it was about supper time. And he said, I looked at my buddy and he said, I bet you if we go down there, they'll, they'll feed us supper. And he said, so we jumped the rail and, and uh, the guardrail and went down into that valley, went down that little log cabin and we knocked on the door. And he says, it was just like something out of a storybook. He said, grandma and grandpa opened the door. And he said, you know, back in those days, and they really did do this. Those, that older generation was known for just hope and company would stop in. And they were known for making enough food to feed an army. I remember going to my grandma's and it was me and my mom and my sister. And when we rolled in, uh, we called her mamaw. She was going to make, she was going to make a spread of food. And they would always fuss at you. You know, you've, you've already had seconds and thirds and your gut's about to bust. And they say, come on, you're eating like a bird. Eat some more. And my, my grandma would fix enough food for 12 people. And that's just, that's just the way they did it. My stepdad said, this old lady opened the door and, her and her husband were there, and they said, come on in. And she had biscuits and cornbread and gravy and everything you can imagine. He said they had the feast of their life. They sat and visited with those folks a while, and they moved on. But there was, there was no warning, just, just stopped in. Paul writes, and he says, Philemon, I, I don't know when I'm getting out of jail. He said, but when I do... He said, you can expect me to come to your house. He said, it'll be one of my first stops. You know, one of the things the Lord Jesus did was he would stop at people's homes. Look at Mark chapter two for a moment. Keep your place in Philemon and look at Mark chapter two. Matthew, Mark, second book in the New Testament, Mark chapter two. Mark chapter 2, verse 14. And as he passed by, that's talking about the Lord Jesus. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom and said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. In the next verse, suddenly there's a, a scene change. Verse 15. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at me in his house, that's Levi, that's Matthew, in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. You know, um, man, the Lord Jesus 
calls Matthew and saves him. And, and in a moment of time, his whole world has changed. And, um, you know, one of the next stops that Jesus makes is his house. The Lord saves Zacchaeus. And one of the next stops on the agenda was Zacchaeus's house. Look at Psalm 101, Psalm. Psalm sort of in the middle of your Bible there. Psalm 101. Paul says to Philemon, I'm coming to your house. And he says, you, you really won't have any idea when I'm coming. I'm coming to your house. Look at Psalm 101. And um, look at verse 1. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. You know, um, if things are are good in your house, they're, they're pretty much good just about everywhere else. If your Christianity is, is doing okay in your house, it's doing okay everywhere else. You know what? We always, we always, uh, people always put their best foot forward and rightfully so when you're out in public, you know. Um, and I remember as a little kid, my mom said to me once, she said, you, you have no idea what goes on <clears throat> in somebody's house. And of course, you know, you grow and you live and you learn and you understand the truth of that statement. <clears throat> if it's good in your house, it's just, just about good everywhere else. Something about your house, it, it seems to be a testing ground. It's where all those things happen behind closed doors. It's where decisions are made. And it's where we feel free to act out what we normally wouldn't feel free to act out. You know, everybody's used to us. We're used to them. You know, we're, we're not trying to make a good impression. We're way past that. You know, um, in your house, you, you may be the only one that's trying to serve the Lord. You might be. Um, at least for a time, you know, when we say, when we say about, you know, the Lord coming to your house and things being right in your house, um, it doesn't mean that everything and everybody will be right because a lot of you in this room, you know, you're, you're part of a house, most of you and, you know, but, but you can't always control everything and everybody in your house. It may be, and I hope this isn't true. But it may be that in your house, the angels weep because they see. They see what nobody else sees. It may be that the angels weep. But if you are right with God in your house, when the Lord comes to your house, he's going to visit with you. He's going to visit with you. Look at John 14, John 14. While you're turning there, I'm going to just remind you of, of a verse that, you know, most of you could quote. Revelation 3.20, and I realize it's talking about the church at Laodicea. But in Revelation 3.20, the Lord Jesus says something. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, that's the door of a church in the context. But the next thing the Lord says is, if any man will open the door. In other words, that, that church was, the congregation 
You know, the Lord really wasn't welcome in Laodicea. But the Lord still would fellowship with people. If any man will open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. You say, wow. You say, I don't know what the Lord would think if he walked into my house. Well, you know what? You, you can't control everything and everybody at your house. But if, if you love him, he'll stop in. And if he stops in, he'll, he'll hang out with you. He'll hang out with you. Look at John 14, verse 18. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. No, boy, oh boy, look at these words. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Now, in the next couple of verses, the Lord's going to expand on that. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it? that thou will manifest thyself. He says, how is it you're going to show yourself to us, but nobody else is going to see you? How, how's that going to be? Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He said, We're, we'll show up at your house. And if you love, Jesus said, You love me? He said, If you love me, my father loves you. And he says, We'll both come. And he said, We'll hang out with you. He said, Philemon, I'm coming. I am coming to your house. And you have no idea when I'm coming. But he said, My destination is your house. Boy, that's where Christianity, it either dies or it thrives. It either, it either dies or it shines in the house. Look at Philemon 1 again. Philemon 1, verse 22. He says, but with all, prepare me also a lodging. Now, the second part, for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. Paul was hoping to come and Paul was hoping to get out of his bonds. He said, I trust that through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. Paul believed and, and the Holy Ghost is recording this. So the Holy Ghost is encouraging this whole line of thought. Paul believed that Philemon's prayers would tip the scales and would make all the difference and would break his chains and bring him freedom and bring him a time of wonderful fellowship that he had enjoyed in quite a while. He believed Paul's prayers would free, he believed Philemon's prayers would free him and take away a hindrance. You know, boy, there's a big hindrance in Paul's life. I, You know, jail would be a pretty big hindrance. And every time Paul stood up somewhere, he wasn't just in some air-conditioned cell somewhere. He was in those primitive prisons. And every time Paul stood up anywhere, he held up his chains. Yeah, it's, it's just a wee bit of a hindrance. He said... Um, he said, Philemon, he said, I believe that your prayers will take away my greatest hindrance right now. And he said, I believe your prayers will bring a joyful encounter. He believed God would move if Philemon would pray for his friend. You know, there's something about that in the Bible. Um, you know, the end of Job, and we read it several weeks ago. You know, Job comes through all his trials 
and he's still in a very low place. And But the book is closing. And the Lord says to uh, Job's three friends, he says, you know, I'm, I'm really angry with you guys. He said, uh, but he said, but you know what? I'm going to have Job pray for you. And he says, because I, I, I'm not going to accept your, your all's prayers right now. He said, you guys are a mess. But he said, but I will accept Job's prayers. Job prays. And, uh, and it says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. You know, um, uh, here you see Paul's real confidence. Paul had some real faith here. He said, I trust that through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. Um, boy, there's some real confidence in this prayer for a person. You know, uh, it, it's easy to pray when, you know, it's, it's it, and it's right. You know, the Lord says, bring all your needs, bring all your burdens, cast all your care on the Lord. And it's, it, it really is easy. You know, you, you have your problems, you have your financial worries, you have all your dilemmas, you have your potential health problems. You have all these things. You got your kids. You got all these things. But, you know, suddenly when you step out of that world and you begin to pray for some other people like you pray for yourself. And God said, you know, he said, I, I honor that. He said, I move when people do that. And he said, I solve the original person's problems when they begin to seriously pray for somebody else. Paul had real confidence in this prayer. Look at, uh, you're there in Philemon, look at verse four. Paul said, I thank my God making mention of the always in my prayers. Look at Philippians, go back just a few pages. You'll see first and second Timothy and keep going back there in a few more pages. You'll hit Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter one. You know what hurts people's prayer life? Is, is their lack of confidence. Now, I'm not saying your lack of positivity. You know, you can look yourself in a mirror and go, we can do this. We can do this. We believe. Believe. Which is a bunch of hooey. You know, go pray to Norman Vince Appeal. See if he helps you. Um, but the Lord said in James chapter 1, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. The Holy Ghost says this. Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and it braideth not, and it shall be given him. But, he says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. He says, let not that man think that he shall receive wisdom. No, let not that man think that he shall receive wisdom. Anything. You know, I, your, your prayer life is, is the thing that really causes a demonstration of the things that we cannot see. And it's one of the most exciting demonstrations of the world we cannot see. There's so much we don't understand. And, you know, we wrestle with our feelings and all that stuff. But when you pray and you take something to the Lord and it's very specific. And the only one that can do it is the Lord. And you say, Lord, I am praying for this. I am praying for this specifically. Lord, I need this. I, I, I really, or, or Lord, I think I need it. I really would like, maybe you don't even need it. You say, oh, Lord, I, I really would like this. And I would like it like this. And all of a sudden, it happens. And then a week later, it happens again. And a week later, you know, all of a sudden, you know what happens? It's like you're going, wow. This, and you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, call unto me, and I will answer thee. Jeremiah 33, 3. And show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. The whole thought of prayer is you call and he answers. It's not something you do, you know, and you never get an answer. And it's just this stale routine. And you, you feel better about yourself when you get up. That's not what prayer is about. 
That's what lost people do when they pray. I remember praying before I got saved because I grew up in a Christian home. And, and, you know, I wasn't against praying. You know, we, we were supposed to do it. And I remember doing it. But you know what I remember? I remember um, never got answers to anything. But I knew it was the right thing to do. So you just do it. Boy, what an exercise in futility. What frustration. What emptiness. What emptiness. Look at Philippians 1, verse 3. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all. He's, he's praying for them, praying for them. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul prayed for them. And you know how he prayed for them? With confidence. He prayed and he absolutely believed that God was going to answer. And God was going to work in their lives. Because he knows that's what God does. That's what God's interested in. People. He wants to help people. He wants to lead people. He wants to take the scales off their eyes. He wants to make this thing real. And Paul said, I, he, says, I, he, he loved the Philippians. He said, I, I pray for you. He said, I never stop praying for you. And he said, and it's a joy to pray because, he said, it's, it, it's, you know, I get a little weary of these books, the spiritual disciplines. It's like, I'm not interested in a spiritual discipline. I, I want an answer. You know, go to my wife. Honey, let's practice. Give me my supper. I'll be back. Let me try this again. Honey, give me some supper. I'm practicing my, my marital disciplines. Give me. Oh, and I'm supposed to work. Okay, let me. We'll try that for a while. That's nonsense. It's a relationship. He said, I'm your father. When you pray, say, our father, which is in heaven, give us this Day, our daily bread, deliver us from evil, lead us not into temptation. He said, you're asking for stuff. Paul was confident, and Paul was confident that if Philemon would pray, God would answer. You know what, he, he was expecting that. You know what expectation brings? It brings rest. You know, if you got on your knees tonight and uh, you, you, you know, going to pray for two or three people that you love and um, maybe one of them's lost. And, um, you know, I, I, I can pray for their salvation, but I, I can't I can't uh, I can't say when God's going to do that. I, I don't know when they're going to respond. I have no idea. But you know what I can answer? You know, what I can ask confidently, confidently. I can get on my knees and I can say, God, they're lost. Now, Lord, your spirit, it's his job to reprove the world of sin and of righteous judgment. Lord, you said that. Now, Lord, I know you're not going to force their hand. I know you're not going to force their will. But, Lord, I am asking you, would you please deal with their heart? Lord, don't know where they're at tonight, but, God, would you speak to them? Would you speak to them? And I can, I can expect Then you pray for somebody else. Lord, so-and-so. You know, Lord, they're, they're backslidden. They're, God, I don't know where they're at. You know, and last I heard, they were in a mess, and, Lord, would you bring somebody across their path? Would you speak to them? Wouldn't it be a blessing? See, we, we pray those things. But if you don't have any confidence that God is going to do anything, you get up off your knees and you think, well, really? Subconsciously, you think, I wonder what good that did. What great faith. And it says in one place, our Lord went into a few towns and he said, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They just, what's he going to do? And Lord said, so I met their expectations. I didn't do anything. <laughs> Expectation brings rest. If you went home tonight and you got on your knees and you prayed for a few of your friends or your, you know, some of your relatives or whatever it is, or maybe something else, and you prayed and you said, Lord, your book says, 
Everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. And so, Lord, that's me. I'm part of everybody. Lord, I don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to do something. Thank you, Lord. I'm counting on you. You know what that brings? That brings rest in your heart. Instead of, well, I wonder what good that did. Well, that's really restful, isn't it? That's comforting. Go to bed. Well, I don't think I did a thing, did I? <laughs> that's painful. You know what that helps you do? It helps you to quit praying. But if you feel like you're talking to God and he's listening, oh, that'll make you want to pray more. Well, if he heard me about that, all right, there's some other things I should talk to you about. And, and faith, that expectation, it brings brightness into your spirit. It really gets rid of a lot of that gloom and doom. Look at verse 23 of Philemon. Verse 23, there salute thee. So these guys are, are, are with Paul or in, in close proximity. One of them he calls his fellow prisoner. So one of them was in the cell or maybe in the cell next door. And, um, and the others were guys that were very nearby, that maybe were visiting Paul on a regular basis. And he says, Philemon, verse 23, he said, there salute thee. He said, I got some people that want to greet you. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. In the, in the Bible, when somebody was saluted, it, it pointed to a few things. It was, sometimes it was just a greeting. Um, uh, but it also showed it was, a, it was an act of respect or honor, you know, in you know, the, the military, you know, they, they salute each other. And that's in keeping with the thought of the word. It's respect and honor. And Paul said, uh, Philemon, he said, you know, in the last little bit here, he said, you know, Onesimus has been around and he's been helping me. And, and he said, uh, you know, some of the guys here that have served the Lord with me, some of them that have risked their neck for Jesus Christ, just like me. He says, we've all got to know Onesimus. He said, now I'm coming to your house. But he said, these other guys, they salute thee. Philemon, their hat is off to you. Philemon, you are known in the distance. You know, even though they didn't have electronics, still word of mouth moves pretty quick. And, uh, you know, Paul would talk about, I, I hear this and I hear that and so-and-so has brought me word. Their ears were always to the ground. He said, um, Philemon, the guys that are with me, they respect you. They respect your Christianity. And they're glad you're still with us. And they're hoping you'll do well. In this list of names, there is a, a name that appears. Verse 24, Marcus Aristarchus Demas. In verse 24, he calls Demas his fellow laborer. Um, you remember, you'll remember um, in, in 2 Timothy 4, a few years later, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know, um, Somewhere in the midst of all that, when, when Paul wrote this letter, Demas was still on board. Uh, you know, serving the Lord with, with Paul was not just showing up at church on Sunday. I mean, these guys that were his fellow laborers, they were always in a jam. They were running for their lives half the time. It was pretty crazy. Somewhere along the line, Demas figured he had enough. And um, But you know the way that works is, it usually, usually, that's not a sudden decision. Usually it's something where people start just, uh, it, it just starts manifesting itself gradually. I remember years ago, my wife talking about uh, a friend of hers that she grew up with and they went to the same church and 
and um, it was it was good family, good moral family, and um, they were farmers. And she said, uh, she said we all were at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and she said, uh, all of a sudden, you know, um, this the, this this family they you know it got busy, it got harvest time, and they they got to where they weren't. They weren't coming for a while. They weren't coming on Wednesday nights at all. And um, then the next thing you know, they started missing the odd Sunday night. And then after a while, they weren't coming Sunday nights anymore. And, and then it was just Sunday morning. And I watched that happen here a, a few months back. And some of you will probably guess what I'm talking about. I watched this, this, uh, this family that, that we all loved. And, and I, um, I remember noticing he started missing and uh, I, I, I thought he had gotten rattled over something that had been said. And all of a sudden he, 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 before that he never missed. And then he started missing, and you know, what people miss, you know, sometimes all they're sick or sometimes they're out of town and you always, you always make allowance for all that. But when it starts to become this real regular occurrence and you're going, they're on their way out. In Proverbs 23, it says, Eat not thou the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. And what you see in this verse is you see a, a sifting that began to take place. And man, we, we saw that. Many of you saw it during COVID. And, and, um, and you see Demas gets sifted out. And what a tragedy. In the eternal record, I mean, it'd be bad enough just to, if God hadn't written it down, but God wrote it down for time and eternity. Demas goes off the page of Scripture as the guy that chucked it all for the bright lights. Demas hath forsaken me. Why? Did Paul hurt him? No. Nope. Did Paul rob him? No. Nope. Did Paul rattle his chain? No. Nope. He just, he just thought, man, I don't know. This is a pretty rough life. I, I think I, I should enjoy life a little bit. The next thing you know, he was out. Demas hath forsaken me. Look at 1 John chapter 2. Go to your right. You're there in Philemon. If you go to the right, you'll see Hebrews and James and 1st, 2nd Peter there. And um, First John. First John two, verse nineteen. First John two, verse nineteen. They went out from us. Now, he's not talking about missionaries and preachers there that were sent out. That's not what he's talking about. And it's obvious from the verse. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, if they'd been on the same page, if they were moving in the same direction, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, and here's the reason that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. God said there was a, there was a purpose. They, they pulled their own move there, but God said there was a spiritual lesson that it was arising out of us, uh, out of it. And he said, God was making something manifest that they weren't moving the same direction. They, uh, they weren't with us. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. You know, we're not, we're not talking tonight about, in this, in this thought, we're not talking about people that come to church once in a while and then they, they find another church. No, that's, that's normal stuff. You know, some people come. Not every church is for everybody. Some people like one church more than another, and they visit for a little while, and they, you know, that's not what he's talking about here. 
Demas was not a visitor. Demas was not somebody trying to find a church. Demas was somebody that seemed like, man, he was he was in, and he was preaching, you know, and he was witnessing, and he was he uh, he seemed like he was part of what was going on. I mean, he was on board, and he had jumped in. You know, there's nothing that that is is really rattles people more, or or is a more difficult thing, is when, in a church. You know, you get people they come. And after a while, they settle in. And that's a good thing. You know, they feel like, okay, praise the Lord. This is our church. We fit. And we're working together. And you know what happens? A bond is formed. A bond is formed. Man, the fellowship, you know, and, and it, it takes time and, and all that stuff. But, but there's, just, uh, there's just something there. And, um, and then one day they... They just sort of go off the rails. They 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 sort of make a turn. They sort of and 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 you know it's it's that is a is hurtful because you're you, by now your heart is invested, you know. And um, and when your heart is invested, and somebody says, "See you later." A lot of you have been through that. Some of you have been through that in other realms of life, you know. Divorce, a tragedy, you know, and, and, um, you know, I, I can't imagine, you know, the, the heartache. I remember getting a letter and, and by the way, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of churches, you know, people are, um, our churches are filled with all sorts of people with all sorts of pasts and all sorts of problems and, and, and everybody's welcome here. And the Lord, uh, man, the Lord, um, he was the friend of sinners and we're all sinners some of us look like we got it all together, but everywhere we got it together, it's only because God has helped us and God has brought a lot of us out of a hole that nobody knows anything about. We're all a mess. We're all sinners saved by grace. That's all we are. And uh, if, if honestly, I say this. I don't know who's who in here, so I'm just throwing this out. If you've got a divorce in your past, uh, you're welcome here, and you're not a second-class citizen. I, I've known Baptist churches where if you were divorced, you couldn't sing in a choir. They'd probably let you work in the nursery and they'd for sure take your money, but they wouldn't let you do anything else. Uh, we don't, we don't feel that way. If that bothers you, see me later and I'll show you Bible grounds why we feel that way. This, some of this stuff really gets weird. You can be a murderer and have buried 20 people out in the back 40 and gotten saved and everybody will sing your praises. But if you've been divorced, God help you. That I, I you say, well, Pastor, that's human reasoning. I agree. But the Lord did say, come now and let us reason. You know, some people's Christianity get these little quirks, and the reason goes way out in the field. I can't imagine. I had a friend of mine when I was in college, and, and we were Mitzi and I were man, we just had Elizabeth and maybe Mary, and and uh, they were babies, and we were just trying to serve the Lord. And when I was in Bible college, a guy that owned a car wash, uh, he was he was a really successful businessman, and he loved the Lord. And I got working for him, and it was a great thing. And um, so when, when we eventually moved away and were trying to get further on into the Lord's work, um, he would uh, send me a letter once in a while. I knew their marriage was in trouble before I left, and he knew his marriage was in trouble. And he told me one day, he said, you know, me and my wife are going away for a little while. And he said, we're bringing a bunch of old pictures. And he said, you know, and you could tell he had really thought this through. He'd been trying to get some counsel. He said, um, he said, you know, you only take pictures of happy times. Nobody takes pictures of tragedies. They only take pictures of good times. He said, we're going to go away. And he said, I'm going to get out those pictures and we're just going to enjoy our time together. I thought, wow, that's pretty smart. That's good. That's good. You know, and you're, you're, you're hoping the best for somebody like that. He sure wanted to save his marriage. I don't know what had happened. I don't think he stepped out or anything. I just think it was something else. One day I got a letter and he said, Brother Joe, he said, we are divorced now. And he said, a line I will never forget as long as I live. He said, much pain is already passed. It just, just those words were pregnant with sadness. You know, um, 
I don't know. I don't know where you're at. I don't know. Um, you know what's going on in your world. But I can't imagine. You know what God has joined together and and hear me. I understand, man. I understand these terrible things that happen. You know, this guy turned out to be a predator or she ran off with the girlfriend or whatever. I, I get that. You know, I'm not, I'm not, but I'm just saying what God has joined together for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and they shall be one flesh. Can you, they shall be one flesh. So what does that mean when it comes apart? It's agony. That's what that means. When you've invested in someone, and many of you, you know all about that, not just divorce, but in in a church setting, okay? You've invested, man. You, you've, you've made that bond, and then they go, don't need you anymore. See you later. That's hard. And you often see that in a church. There's every once in a while, there is this a sifting that takes place. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18. We've seen it this past year on a few counts. And many of you will know exactly what I'm referring to. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For, now watch, there must be also heresies among you. What weird wording the Lord says it must occur. Some wacko slips in and he starts sowing crazy doctrine. There must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. He says God uses that and God sifts things out. And Demas got sifted out, but others were approved faithful. Others will prove faithful. Look at Philemon again. Look at that last verse, and, and you can see a connection here. You can see a connection here. Verse 25. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Lord saved you and, and, and the Lord has, he has poured grace upon us. The Lord says, of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. And that's an odd phrase, grace for grace. John said it in John chapter one, but it means grace heaped upon grace. And, you know, the Lord, for by grace you saved through faith. And, and man, he is just, from that day, as of the, that first day of being saved, all along the road, he's, he's showered grace. And grace is just that unmerited favor. It's the goodness of God to people that don't deserve it, to people that really are going the opposite way altogether. And he showers them with his grace. This is the grace of our Lord. Be with your spirit. He says, you know, there's going to be some demons along the way. He said, don't let them sour your spirit. He said, you know, you may have some, some dark things in the walls of your house. He said, he said, don't let that sour your spirit. He said, just remember the Lord Jesus said, I'm going to come and I'm going to visit you at your house. You know, there'll be some things that will come your way. And he said, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. You know, one of the things I've noticed about some of the people that are um, just the worst troublemakers as far as Christianity, these people like Demas or people that come in and they try to sow weird doctrine, try to tear up a church. One of the things you'll, you'll notice about them is their spirit is wrong. It's not a gracious spirit. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a joyful spirit. It's a, you know, they they've got a bone to pick. They've got a they've got an axe they want to grind. Uh, they they want to they want to. You know, the mark of every cult is, you know, nobody had it right till we came along. 
And, um, and you know what, you know what they'll do? They'll come in and, um, you know what the, the house of God is supposed to be like? It's supposed to be a very pleasant place. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is. How pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Enter into His courts with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. You know, our Lord's Christianity, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace. And he writes to Philemon and says, Philemon, I hope you'll I hope you'll handle this thing with Onesimus right. He said, It's it's been a grief. He said, Onesimus has hurt you. And he says, But Onesimus has gotten right with God. He said, On top of that, he said, I'm coming to your house. He said, On top of that, he said, I'm counting on your prayers. He said, I think you've got a real connection with God. And he closes it all out. And he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, your spirit, you know, your spirit. That's that inner man. You know, uh, I, I think if there was a prayer that we could pray for the new year, you know, I don't know what's ahead for you and me. I hope this is the best year. I hope it's bright. I hope it's prosperous. I hope it's healthy. I hope your your relationships are wonderful. I hope you get prayers answered and it'd be a good year. But it'd be a good year, too. If the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was with our spirit, that'd be a good thing to pray. So we're going to close the message right there. We sort of covered a lot of ground tonight. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're thinking. You know, you're home or maybe maybe you got somebody that's bailed on you and you got somebody. I, I don't know where you're at tonight, but I know this. If you call, he'll answer. And God says, if you'll call, confidently I will answer and he says if you'll pray for other people like you pray for yourself he said I'll answer he said I care about those people in your life more than you care for them what wow, what a thought you know it's like we're trying to coax God to do something he's like no he says I, 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 I got that covered I want to do it more than you want to ask good prayer for the new year Lord may your grace no matter what comes, may your grace be with my spirit. Let's pray. Lord, may we hear your voice tonight, Lord. May you touch that thing, Lord, where you want to help us the most. And Lord, may we throw open the door to you and say, Lord, yes. yes. Work in my heart and my life. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, if God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to him?
Lord, we thank you that you're good. And Lord, we thank you for your grace. And uh, Lord, we sure appreciate it. Lord, we just pray that you keep pouring it on us, Lord, and help us to keep asking for it. And uh, Lord, uh, help us to love you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.